All right. And with that, I want to say, hey, Don, welcome to the Survival Podcast. Thanks for having me. Having me. Pleasure being here. Well, immediate techno gremlins as soon as we go live. Um, you've gone full static on me. I'm not sure why. We were fine before we went live here. Um, static. Yeah, you're like really bad static. And it's not me this time. Audio, audio. Audio. No, no, it's it's unusable at this point. Um, and I don't know why, because we had we did a sound check, guys. We had a great. No, absolutely not. Um, try unplugging those headphones a second. Okay. Headphones are unplugged. Okay, so now okay, you're good. So now you're good. Okay. And now I've got echo. Now I've got echo. So let me plug it back in and see. All right, headphones are plugged in. And I don't have echo, and you're clear. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. so we're good for now. We will see. <laughs> I wonder if a wire across there or something across another wire. All right. So we're going to – well, there goes static again. We'll see. Say something. Say something. Testing. Oh, it's coming back. What the hell? Um, I can change the input maybe to the, to my computer mic. Try yeah, try that. that. Try that. Try that. Hey, we're not supposed to be starting for another two minutes, guys, so give us a break. <laughs> we'll be with you in a moment. Audio. It's weird because when you first plug in your headphones, it's dead clear, and then it just starts fading. Okay, testing. How does that yeah. sound? That's, that's good. Okay, it, cool. It's not as deep and rich as your mic, but at least it's yeah. clear. So, all right, so let's go from there. We should be good now. We shall try. All right. And uh, so we're going to start for officially recording for the audio podcast now, guys, because people on the audio won't get to see this uh, this monkey show. All right. With that, hey, Don, man, welcome to the Survival Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jack. It's a pleasure being here. I I'm really excited to have you on today, Don. Um, when this form came through, you know, I get submissions all the time. We, we have probably half the people that submit. Sooner or later, we have them on the air. But a lot of times it's like, oh, we did this, like, we've never done this. We've never talked about an alternative form of housing using pole barn construction. So I thought it was really cool. I had this idea in my head what that would look like. Looked up your YouTube channel and that's a beautiful house. Not that I expected it to be crappy or anything, but sure. it's not as like kind of rustic or whatever as I expected. So it's really cool topic. Glad to have you on today. But I want to start out with like, kind of what is your background like? before you got into homesteading everything, like you're spacing out in school or something, you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. What did you do professionally and how did that get to a point where you decided like, I want to do something else? Yeah, definitely. Um, I am a former band teacher in the public schools actually, uh, living here in the Fairfax, Virginia, Northern Virginia area. Uh, went to school here, met my wife, we were both music majors and, and I taught school and we were just living in a townhouse in suburbia, living, living our best lives. and starting to have kids um, and just just doing our thing. It, it, there was like no complaints. It was a good life, um, but it was just it was just average, you know? And I guess things kind of pick up when you start to watch YouTube channels and listen to podcasts about doing more with your life. And, and I guess, you know, through a series of different events, we end up here. But uh, yeah, I used to be a band teacher and now I'm stay at home dad and do a little YouTube and trying to homestead and finish this darn house build. <laughs> very, very cool. I, you know, we beat up on YouTube a lot because of their censorship and what have you, but they've done a lot of good too. I would say that YouTube's created more homesteaders in the last 10 years than every book on homesteading written between about 1920 and 1980 did. Like it, it's really good because people see it, they understand it. They feel like, well, if this person can do it, I can do it. And uh, I think it's just a better way of life. Um, you eventually got to a point where like not only did you want a homestead a lot of people kind of homestead in the city or the outskirts of the city you're like enough yeah rat race gone let's go somewhere else let's do this for real what was it like 
when you left the rat race of suburbia behind and why did you really decide like it's time to actually to jump to leap well, well i i guess, I guess we could we think, think the the, uh, uh, the, housing the housing market at the time you know in northern virginia houses can sell for a lot of money and it was the spring of 2018 and my wife had just transitioned from trying to push into the opera scene. She's a very talented voice artist and uh, she wanted to try audiobooks. So we are living in a townhouse, all the noise around us. She's trying to record audiobooks from home. And as you know from doing podcasts at home, noise is noise. And the market got hot. The, the townhouse two doors down from us listed for over 300,000. And three years ago, or three years before that, we had just bought ours for like 235. And I'm like, wait, dang that, that that's that's expensive and i had already done some work you know thinking about you know saving money and whatnot as soon as we bought our townhouse i put a kitchenette in the basement and said we're gonna get a tenant in here right away they're gonna pay our mortgage for us so that we can continue saving and paying off college loan debt and all that kind of good stuff but when i saw that opportunity with the market getting hot and the idea of going somewhere a little more quiet out of the hustle and bustle of northern virginia we had to jump on it so uh yeah, my, my best friend from college happened to become a real estate agent, and he came over. He's like, yeah, we'll, we will get you top dollar right away, asking price, good to go. So, um, yeah, we're just taking advantage of our surroundings, really. And, and like I said, after looking at YouTube and listening to stuff, I, I figured if I could get, get at least an acre somewhere out of suburbia, there would be a lot more I could do with my life and provide for the family. So what made you choose your current location where is it how far is it from where you you guys left behind etc like because what i've learned as we started kind of doing this ourselves and leaving like the place that was just where we had to be because that's where my wife wanted to be because that's where sisters and parents were when we kind of said like okay we're still going to be around family but like two hour circle around dallas fort worth that's a big piece of place i can only imagine being able to go anywhere and then because most people that shop for property, like I want to be in the zip code or next to this, you know, my job or whatever. How did you guys decide on the place and, and where did you end up? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So, so with Natalie's family kind of all being in Northern Virginia, she grew up around Fairfax. Um, my wife is Natalie, by the way. <laughs> but uh, with, with them being so local, we wanted to stay close. And at the time, I was still a band teacher. Didn't really have plans on quitting being a band teacher because I was like the, the main income for the family with the benefits of being a teacher and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so we, we had our little radius where I needed to have the band job and be within an hour, hour and a half of our family. Uh, Cause we're, you know, her side of the family is pretty tight knit with a lot of kids uh, coming up through the ranks and everything. So we, we had our radius and we were looking West to get out of D, you know, the DC area and uh, out of the beltway for sure. So we looked west towards the mountains and it was really funny. Our family had gone on a vacation to the mountains and uh, they took the kids for, my in-laws took the kids for a day and Natalie and I went, you know, visiting all the wineries that had all these beautiful views. We're like, dang, this is pretty nice. Let's move out here. And then we did. (laughs) So uh, we just looked in the area, saw, you know, like my commute to work wouldn't be more than an hour and a half. And so we moved out towards the, the Front Royal area of Virginia, right along the Appalachian Trail and Shenandoah National Park, Skyline Drive, all the, all the beauty that's out here without being busy in Northern Virginia. So that's where we moved to. Yeah, I think that like, you know, people here in West Virginia and there's, there's the state and then there's the Western part of Virginia and it is night and day different from, you know, where you think of, when you think of Virginia and you think of like the DC metro area and Richmond around there, it's, Virginia is a huge state. I think that's another thing people kind of lose sight of, like, because it it starts out skinny and it gets really big by the time it gets into the western. I remember the first time I drove through that part of Virginia, it was when I decided to come to Texas uh, back in uh, '93, and I remember driving through there and thinking, "God, this is a beautiful, rugged country." So, go for the wine, stay for the view, and uh, build a homestead. Cool. <laughs> that wineries attract me too. We just found a really cool one down the road, and like, we're gonna like we're gonna support them. We're gonna run events there and stuff because it's a it's a cool new industry coming up um how did you choose the location like where you're going to site your home on this new homestead and i'm sorry if i missed it there um did you say how many acres of land you guys got 
Uh, so uh, we so ended we up getting, getting this five-acre five acre plot. plot. Okay. Uh, I wanted more than a couple acres for sure. So you know, as you do, you're you're stalking Zillow and Realtor.com and Redfin, and I had been looking for a long time trying to find the spot where I could convince Natalie to leave what she was used to behind. You know, she was used to having everything so close and walking distance, and and so I it needed to be the perfect property. And when when I first saw this property listed. It had been listed for 11 years and <laughs> and it had just tons of trees everywhere a really old cabin but the, the the benefits huge benefits were it had all the utilities there it had well septic and electric hooked up to this old cabin and i think that the guy would have sold it in one year instead of 11 had he torn down that old cabin and just said hey home site ready to go hour and a half from washington dc it would have sold like hotcakes so when I saw that, I saw the potential, you know, you look at the topographical maps and, and uh, the GIS stuff and kind of look around and, and see the area. And I, I really liked it, but I'd never told Natalie about it. I was like, gosh, she's not gonna go for that. It's not like the spot yet. I'd have to do a lot to it. But then like two months later, Natalie's like, hey, I'm looking up for property and what do you think of this one? And she showed me the listing. I was like, dude, that's, that's where I wanna go. <laughs> and uh, so it was just kind of like perfect. And uh, we, we checked it out. We came up here and we could tell that if you just clear a select few trees, you get this million, do million dollar view looking east, the sun rising uh, towards Washington, D.C. And again, so close to the Appalachian Trail and all these great things around us. So it had more acreage. It had the five acres and, you know, maybe we'll do more someday. But uh, this was a really good start for us and having utilities in place. We knew that with, with some work, that we could uh, really make this place our forever home, little slice of heaven on the mountain. I think there's definitely something in looking for property that has some sort of eyesore or problem that really isn't a problem, like a bulldozer or a match and a can of gasoline, and that problem is gone, right? Like, yep. there's a lot of ways to make that problem go away because most people they can't see past a problem. If you watch like real estate shows, like even like house hunters and stuff like that, the, the things people bitch about are so stupid. They're like, I don't like this color. There's a store called Home Depot. They sell paint, yeah. right? Like it's like the easiest thing. Literally anybody can do it. A few gallons of paint, the room is not blue anymore. Now it's tan or beige or whatever you want it to be. And while I teach people like fix all that stuff, if you're the seller, when you're the buyer, I teach the exact opposite. Like look for as many of those easy layup fixes that the seller's too lazy or doesn't have the money to fix that you can find. I'm usually looking for probably has been on market for like four months or more, 11 years. That's like the yeah. predatory freaking fangs start coming <laughs> exactly. out. And like, you're like, Mr. Burns, like, excellent. Like, cause you know, you know there's, there's a two edged sword, right? Like, you know, you can negotiate. You also know like guys only so willing to negotiate cause he's waited 11 years and not, you know, not dumped it, but that's really cool. And that that's a big strategy with homes, land, whatever. If it's an eyesore, but it's easily fixed, it's an advantage to the buyer and a disadvantage to the seller. And then if you're flipping property, <laughs> remember that on the other side. For sure, yeah. Um, so then you get this brilliant idea. And so you, I, I imagine the conversation with the wife goes something like, listen, babe, I got this great idea. We're gonna build this really great house. It's gonna be cool. Until then, we're going to live in a camper. It'll be cool. So how did that go over and what was it actually like in practice? Yeah, you know, we've heard of other people doing it. People glorify it on Instagram. Yeah, we're going to live in our camper and build our home. And like there's TV shows about it and stuff. There's homesteaders that do it on YouTube, travel across the country in their camper with their family of five. And so I will say this, that had we known, you know, it would be the way it was, when I was pitching that to her, she never would have said yes. It uh, it was not that easy, and you know, both of us had an, had experiences as younger kids with their own families camping, and maybe even doing some camper stuff just for like a week in the summer. You know, go down to the local campground and park it. And wow, uh, the camper life was interesting. And you know, especially when you come up to a mountain, and we're at 1,500 feet up where we are now, so it's not like it's not the it's not the Rockies, but it's five degrees colder up here. And when we have two inches of snow down he up here, they have nothing down there. So all these elements go are need to be factored in. And campers are not built for full-time living, especially the one that we picked up. We just picked up a secondhand one 
and uh, a good deal on it, 27 footer. And we thought, yeah, we'll make this work. It'll be it'll be rough, but we'll we'll make it work. Little did we know we'd have pipes freezing all over the place, and you know I wasn't very experienced with uh, septic management, but I became experienced very quickly. You could say. Uh, pro tip: don't leave your poop door open because all those gases and fumes will come right back up at you. Because I thought, well, there's septic on site already. I'm just gonna run along poop holes all the way down to the septic clean out, and it'll be perfect. And after a couple days of we'll leaving that open, and it was a hot summer day in the middle of a camper with a family of four, uh, yeah, I was in trouble. So there's lots of things that we ran into, you know, frozen water lines. I had to get the heated hose going from the, the well spigot all the way up to the camper because it kept freezing. And the worst part was the first winter we were up here, massive ice storm. And, you know, the mountain's losing power all the time. I have to go outside, turn on the generator just to keep it going. And one night I just heard trees falling all around us. I'm like, you know what? You're, you are you are the guy in charge right now. You need to get your family out of there because the tree's gonna fall on your freaking camper and crush everybody. So we spent two nights in the hotel, made it like a vacation for the kids, swimming in the pool of the hotel and everything. But it was it was pretty it was pretty dark there for a little bit, just trying to manage the space and the elements and all the craziness. Um, and eventually, you know, later on we started building the house we had a crew come and start it but we moved in way too early into an unfinished house because our camper there is a nearby lightning strike and right after replacing the inverter it fried the inverter again and fried our air conditioning and everything so yeah the camper life was a little more complicated than I had anticipated for sure yeah and I think no matter where you are you have your own unique challenges. If you do that here in Texas, you're not going to have, well, this year we did for a couple of weeks, but you're not going to have the cold challenges in general, right? But air conditioning a camper when it's 111 degrees is a lot of energy and a lot of work and doing things like putting some sort of cover over it or whatever. I think there's a lot of ways to do that. I think a camper can work. Mm -hmm. Some of them are so cheap now, you could get two. That might help so <laughs> that people have their own little space they can get away from, like, sure. Use one for, you know, use one and use the kitchen in it and use the other one more like it's just a lounge area. I, there's, I, you know, and then sell it. If you can buy it cheap, you can sell it for what you had and don't count it as a cost because, or, you know, if you bought it for five grand and sell it for four grand, you rented it for two years for a grand. That's for the sure, way sure. to look at that. Yeah. Um, but it has the challenges. You, you'd almost think sometimes maybe throwing in a, I don't know, a 12 by 18 tough shed and having it spray foamed. Well, would be would be a better way to live and then when you build your house you have like a badass shed or you have like uh, a really cool office or studio or something like that that you can then rely on you know and maybe you still drag one of those campers up there and you use it when it's convenient and you all you know kind of fit in less space when it's not i i don't know but i think you're right on maybe too early like it's hard to be your own general contractor if you're not on site. So it has that, yes. like, what, how do we do this? I guess the other thing though, is you're kind of through it now, right? Yeah. 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 So. And, we, and actually we actually did what you suggested. Suggest we put, put a shed, shed in place, place. cause my wife being an audiobook recorder, narrator, she needed her studio. So the first thing we did is put a 12 by 24 shed on there. The biggest one we could get without the permit being required by the county. And I put that studio in there and then storage and all that kind of stuff, because we did not have enough space for all of our junk. And yeah, exactly, being on site so that we can start managing the beginning of the process and all the contractors coming out for concrete and whatnot. Um, and it's also way better than paying a thousand dollars a month rent for your family to be, you know, an hour away too, so. Yeah, absolutely. So um, why'd you choose pole barn as, as the type of structure to build? I've actually not heard of that before. I was like, well, is it a barn dominium? And it's like, not sure. really, it's sort of, but not really. Like barn dominiums are usually like steel frame, prefab, what have you. Like what led you down that path? Yeah, they're very closely related. And we knew that we wanted something that I was going to be able to do a lot of work on. You know, originally I had the pie in the sky idea of me setting the posts myself in the ground. But you know, pole barn post frame structures have been around for quite some time and they got especially popular, um, I believe back uh, during the days of the, of the depression and everything. And then moving forward, people were looking for cheap materials to build with. And especially after World War II, you started seeing people put these, these foam poles in the ground and they require a lot less lumber than a traditional stick 
built home will require because of the frame. Uh, and they require almost no foundation. In fact, you could say it doesn't have a foundation. And when we're building up on the side of a mountain and I've got a 40% grade to contend with, you know, excavating out 10 foot deep, you know, walkout basement or a big old foundation that I just wasn't interested in that because I was gonna be really complicated and really expensive. And so with a pole barn house or a pole barn structure, you're relying on those posts to be four to five feet deep in the ground and they are they are your foundation and um, you know it's definitely not traditional as far as like a house would be concerned but once you get that that frame up once you get the posts in place then you can kind of do what you want and you know we opted you'll see on our youtube channel we opted for the black color because we like that that black modern look kind of like the cabin in the woods like scandinavian a little bit um, but we really liked how how we could put it in pretty dang quick and it's also cheaper because of uh, less wood. Obviously, the lumber prices have gone up since then, so it would have been even been worse now. But uh, having no foundation necessary and being able to put it up quick was really important. Our builder, uh, they came down from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it was an Amish crew, three or four guys at a time, depending on the day, and they had that sucker up in nine days. I mean, what house can you put up in nine days? You really can't. So, uh, and then with the idea that I wanted to do a lot of work myself inside, when you're dealing with the pole barn structure, there are no interior load bearing walls. So whatever I did inside, I knew that if I screwed up really bad, the house wouldn't fall down, <laughs> you know? So uh, there was all, all that kind of like, we could customize it to be our own. We could say, hey, build this shell, this beautiful shell right here on the mountain, and then we can do our own floor plan. We can change where the bedrooms and bathrooms are and and put things different places and it's funny actually we started putting up the interior walls and then we decided this looks a little too cramped in here so we took down a wall that we had just put up and said no nah, we're not going to have that many bedrooms so there's a lot of flexibility with a pole barn post frame structure that is not offered in a traditional stick build for sure yep for those that are on the live feed, I've got a uh, photo I was able to grab off of a video here uh, of your your place showing, and it like I said, it's it's I don't think it's what people would immediately come to in their mind when they think of a pole barn structure. It's it's really cool, and uh, I just wanted to kind of pop that up there and show off that I am learning how to use Streamyard. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a really cool looking home, and it's interesting that like the the no interior load bearing wall is something I hadn't thought of. And that is huge because yeah, like you can't screw up the ins. I guess you can screw up the inside like, Hey, I don't like the way that looks or what have you, but what's not going to happen is you're, you're not going to end up in a situation where the roof comes down on top. Exactly. I, you know, like, so that's, that's really, really cool. Um, now it used to be if you moved out and stick somewhere like you are, or what have you, you did what you wanted and nobody bothered you. Um, there are still places like that where I live. I'm fortunate unless I, I, the sheriff literally told me, unless you're cooking meth, we don't care what you do, do whatever. Yeah, like yeah. we don't have time for that crap. There's no codes, no building inspections. I've found more and more throughout the country that that's not the case. And even places just like where I live only a few miles away in a different County have a totally different, thing as far as inspections and all. So when you're putting in a pole barn structure, um, what was that like? As far, was there any codes, inspections, things you had to go through? And, and how did you get through those? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we are still considered like in the northern area of Virginia a little bit. And so they were used to the typical uh, you know, stick built or brick single family home. And so when I brought this to the to the building office at the county seat, they're like, they just looked at me like I was handing them something written in, you know, some other language. And I'm just like, well, I, it's, it's an engineered drawing. My builder engineered it. It is safe. It's good to go. And it took many visits back and forth. And it's a 45 minute drive into the middle of the county seat, 45 minute drives back and forth, talking to them on the phone and just kind of convincing them that this is viable and that there are ways to work around the issues that they brought up. They, they were concerned about insulation. Um, I, I ended up spray foaming my house and that's kind of a long story, but I spray foamed it and they're like, well, what are you going to do about ventilation? Because you're air sealing your house tight. I'm like, exactly. I am. You put in an air handler that 
manages the airflow on your terms, not managing, you know, a leaky house that's traditionally built that has, you know, fiberglass. And uh, so you can, you can work around all of the, the problems that they were, you know, giving to me. I'm like, nope, here's this, here's that. And a couple times I actually had to get the engineers from my builder on the phone with them just to kind of say, no, these structures are sound, it's gonna last forever. And a concern that the county had, and a, cons and a concern that a lot of people have with pole barn structures, post frame structures, is what about those posts in the ground? You're putting wood in the ground, isn't that gonna rot? Well, you know, the old structures are still standing because those were with old growth timbers and really good dense wood, and they maybe treated them, maybe not, but they're still standing. But now with the quick growth wood that has the farther rings in the, in the grain of the wood, it's weaker, so you definitely have to do something. So we told them, no, we're protecting them. And there's a product called Green Post, and it's this plastic sleeve that gets kind of molded on to the bottom of your post. So that all the way down to the bottom and all the way up through above the soil line, which is where the rot will occur, all that stuff is protected. And they even had a coating inside of that, but I had no worries about putting that in the ground because I know that that will protect those posts. It's never gonna fall down. You know, you don't have to worry about the barn falling over and killing my family. Like everything was going to work. So it took some fine, uh, some finagling and some convincing with the county. But eventually, after about five or six weeks of back and forth, we were able to get it pushed through for sure. Yeah, I, it's status jujitsu. Use words they <laughs> understand. Say things the way they want to hear them. Bring expertise in. It's interesting that you even have to explain this stuff because you're sitting there going. Well, Bill's barn was built in 1880 and it's still there. So maybe yeah, yeah. we don't need to worry about it falling down. We actually have maybe not as good of materials today from a standpoint of timber, but we have better technology today than exactly. Bill's great, great grandfather had when he built that barn. And here they are all over the country without killing people. And maybe this is going to be okay. And I, I think a lot of these people, they're just, they don't understand anything that's not in their book. Right. They're just they were hired into a bureaucratic position. They were trained into a bureaucratic mindset. They tick all the boxes. They check off things every day that are probably unsafe. Yep, yep. But they're they're in the words they understand. We we learned a lot about words that people understand when we were trying to get like insurance. Like you don't tell people that you have a permaculture farm at an insurance company. You tell them you have an organic farm mm -hmm. or you tell them you have a farm. Farm yeah, yeah, insurance it's... doesn't have anything to do with whether it's organic, permaculture, regenerative. Like, they don't care about that. But if you use a word like that, all of a sudden, like, uh, I don't know what to do. I, I'm sorry. I used a word you didn't know. Absolutely. Just just put farming down. Just put house. I think the, the advantage with what you've built over some other alternatives is, for instance, I looked at a, a geodesic dome. And it was a hell of a deal. It was more than I spent pent here. But it was a great price. The I looked at the kitchen and just off the top of my head said, if I built that kitchen, that's $65,000. And, and it was eight acres and the house was over 4,000 square foot, incredibly energy efficient. And I think the guy wanted 265 for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I couldn't even afford to build that. And I love kitchen. So I'm like, yeah. And we couldn't get a mortgage approved for it because it was in a circle. Right. So you might, I'm going to get into your financing and stuff here in a minute, but I think once it's done, it's a square house or a rectangular house with a roof on it. So it'll appraise as real estate. And if you need to sell it, cause you should always have an exit strategy, you won't have that problem. And it's a shame, but it comes to the same thing. Like it amazed me that none of the appraisers that were approved for a mortgage company were willing to appraise the value of the home, just relating, okay, here's the acreage, here's the square footage, et cetera. Here's a house down the street that's comparable. Cause that house was square and this one was round. They wouldn't do it. But the city and the county had no problem appraising it to tax it, <laughs> right? So it was it was amazing to me. But I think that maybe that like when you're looking at alternative structures, if you're not gonna, if you don't really believe you're gonna be there forever, at least stay in square probably has some advantages. For sure. sure. So you wanted to do everything yourself. I think you wisely brought in help, right, for parts of it. But what kind of skills did you have going in? What what did you develop during that time? And, you know, what didn't work out? Like, what kind of setbacks did you have? Maybe eventually it worked out, but you had to retool it, or you just en ended up saying, I'm not doing this, and tag somebody in to take care of certain things. 
Sure, sure yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there's good old YouTube University, <laughs> and uh, any DIYer has watched at least three to five videos to prepare for the next project they're doing. So that that was a huge thing that I used. And back at our old townhouse, like I mentioned earlier, I put in a kitchenette down there, and that I had never done really plumbing before. I'd never put in cabinets before, but I kind of built up the confidence from that project. But other than that, I was just a regular Joe that you know does my own oil changes. Like I, I like working with my hands, but uh, I didn't really have that much uh, experience and knowledge, you could say, going into this. So I somehow was able to convince my wife that it was going to be okay, and. And again, had she known that we would run into things that we ran into, maybe she would have been like, eh, I don't know about this. Let's hold off for a little bit. But, uh, you know, I, from doing plumbing and doing electrical and then framing up walls and all that kind of good stuff, it's, it's, it's kind of straightforward for the most part. You know, I had an electrician put in the main panel and then from there I branched out from it. And obviously when you're working with electricity, as long as you turn off that main panel, you're good. You're not going to kill yourself. So just remembering things like that, as long as, you know, the poop flows downhill with your septic system, you're good to go, that kind of stuff. Um, it was just a lot of watching and watching other people screw up, watching other people do it right on YouTube and then doing it myself. And then, you know, eventually we started our own channel and showed all of our screw ups and failed inspections. And, you know, you, you learn along the way. And again, because the house was strong and up already, I wasn't worried about killing anybody as long as, you know, I figured out all the electricity stuff. But there was definitely some stuff like where I failed inspections. But luckily, you know, going back to count, having the county involved, my inspector is an awesome guy. He's super understanding, super helpful. I can email him, be like, hey, I'm doing this for the plumbing. And he's like, yep, sounds good. And he'll come and he'll check it off. And if something was wrong, he would explain it to me. So I guess that is one possible perk of having somebody looking over your shoulder. Um, you know, normally it'd be cool to not have that requirement, but in this case it worked out. You know, every failed inspection was a learning experience for us, whether it's plumbing or framing. You know, I, as a new builder, I didn't know that the interior walls sitting on top of the slab needed the pressure treated bottom plate because I'd never built a house before. I just built decks and that was it. So. You know, he came in, he's like, oh, by the way, I'm going to fail you for that framing because that bottom board is not pressure treated. So then I'm down there on my hands and knees, knocking out all the sill plates at the bottom. You know, it's just, you, you live and you learn and you, you figure your things out as you go. And, you know, it's sometimes you end up spending a little bit more money along the way, but we have, you know, I'm sure we'll talk later. I have more projects coming up and all this experience that I'm gaining through building this house, I'm going to be able to, you know, put forward to the future projects we have coming up for sure. Now you were able to raise some capital, right? When you um, sold your home uh, it, and moved, but some of that probably had to go to like buy the property and what have you. So you're doing something a little unconventional pole barn. I think this would apply to barn dominiums, probably other alternative construction, uh, getting a, a mortgage or a building loan on those may be a little bit different. How, how are you funding this? Were you able to acquire funding through conventional channels with a little creativity or are you doing a pay go how did how do you make this work yeah, yeah so, so I, I mentioned earlier that we sold that townhouse uh during the height of a market so we left with over sixty thousand dollars cash on top of that and then we had just bought the thing three years before so we were able to take that and apply it forward towards getting this land um we got the land for just over one hundred fifty thousand for five acres in Northern Virginia. Elsewhere, it sounds really expensive, but for around here, I was like, dang, with our view and utilities already on site, we had a lot going for us. Um, so we were able to take that and then, you know, obviously I had my full-time job and Natalie was starting to pick up more gigs uh, as an audiobook narrator. And now she's like a big time award winner and everything. And eventually I was actually able to quit my teaching job to focus on the house and the kids because she was started tripling my income. And when you're a teacher, that's not hard to do. But uh, she, she, we're very blessed and thankful that she's able to make as much as she does. Um, but as far as like, kind of like paying for everything, I guess you could say that's why the house in some ways has taken so long to build because we are building with the cash. And the idea is that after taking out our land loan, it was about six and a half percent interest on the land loan because they, they got really, they got nothing to go off of. They, they wouldn't actually count the cabin as a viable structure. 
and eventually we, we would tear it down and make space for the house. So it was a land loan for six and a half percent. We got, you know, we had to get enough credit to get that with the, with the capital we had coming from the old house. And then we were able to just kind of build as we could. It was about 12 months after we moved on site from, uh, from the time we moved on to the time we gave our builder our first check for the, for the structure is about 12 months. So again, we were able to build up a little bit more on the back end as far as cash flow goes. Um, and I can tell you in the audience, the shell of our house cost about $50,000. So that was kind of like, you know, taking 60 and down payment for the land and this and that, you know, eventually we were able to make it work and, you know, building with cash, we had dreams of a big, you know, like a barn dominium, like you see in Texas, like a big, big shop space and all that good stuff. And we ended up chopping the house basically in half because we were building with cash. And when, you, when you're trying to be more financially secure and not taking out giant mortgages and, and loans and this and that, you gotta make sacrifices, you know? And so we built much smaller than we wanted to, but we had the cash coming in and that's how we made it work. But uh, if you have to finance a pole barn house, a barn dominium, you know, not, a, not everybody's gonna do it with cash. If you have to finance it, that's fine. There are ways to do that, usually through your local lenders. Um, you can't get it through a big mortgage company usually. Uh, you have to be really careful with how you use your words. Like you were saying, you have to speak their language. And so do not call it a pole barn house. Do not call it a barn dominium when you want to build it. You say, I would like the loan, I would like a construction loan for a custom wood framed building with metal siding. And they they usually don't say anything beyond that. And you know, there there are lenders that are customized and specialized in these structures. But if you want to go the more traditional route with more traditional low rates, uh, don't don't give them too much information. Just give them what they need to know. It's going to be a house, wood frame like any other house, and it's going to have some some metal siding on the side. So that'll be cool too. You know, don't don't shoot yourself in the foot when you're trying to get financed. And I think one of the things I've learned with some of these, even when they're hard to finance, usually when they're done, they're not. So I've seen people build smaller than they want then get an appraisal after it's done. It appraises really, really well now, and it's a done house. There's no explaining to do. It's a house, it's there. And then they'll take a mortgage and they'll expand. So when they do it, they'll build the house with expansion in mind. So this wall has always been designed to have doors in it or to go away or something like that. Um, and then usually when you're doing that, you're taking basically a home equity line of credit you don't really have to explain what you're going to do with the money. And then often when the house is done, they'll reappraise and refinance. And then you actually take a, a better interest rate because you have a lower, uh, lower loan against value ratio at yeah, that yeah. point. So um, Gary Collins, who used to be on the expert council, uh, he did that because he was doing some sort of SIP type construction or something that was hard to finance. So he basically built his house with a credit card and then was able to finance it through a bank once it was done exactly. and have a reasonable payment on it. So there's a lot of ways to be creative with it. Um, sounds like what you did worked out. I mean, what you're doing does take longer. Uh, it does require more sacrifice, but those who take longer require more sacrifice initially tend to end up doing better long term because I'm sure, you know, 15 years from now, but somebody like, you live here mortgage free. You're so lucky, right? Like exactly. it's not nothing to do with luck. It has to do with planning and sacrifice and sweat equity and all that other stuff. And it's it's why you know people are shocked when they look at houses that like their grandparents grew up in and like you had eight kids in this little house. <laughs> well, that's that's how Grandpa built the house, right? He did exactly what you did, and so you build smaller homes, and you know you all also also often look at old homes and you're like. Well, there's edition one, there's edition two, yep. there's edition three. This is when they converted the basement or whatever. Like you, you can actually see it grow. And it was, it was to be fair, it was easier to do back then. You didn't have to have 47 different bureaucrats come <laughs> check boxes. Because I watch these home improvement shows and I'm always shocked. And they're like, well, you know, we, we're going to need some more money from you for this rebuild. And the guy's like, well, why? You know, did you find something? Back? Well, no, you have too many windows on the west wall of the house. And they won't approve it unless we take a window away. And you're like, but the house was there for 85 years with 
six windows on that side of the house. But now that it's being redone, the new code applies and you can only have five windows because apparently it's a fire threat is the way they justify this because it can hmm. spread through the window to the next house. You're like, well, the next house is 150 yards over there, right? Like, so like there's all of this crap now and it sounds like at least where you are, it's not, it's not that bad, you know, but it amazes me what we have to go through just to, to build a home. And just a couple generations ago, nobody would have ever said anything to you about how you built a home on your land. It was one thing if you were a commercial builder developing a subdivision, that you were going to sell to people. But if you bought a piece of land and you picked up a hammer and a saw, God help anybody that would have said anything. And we've we've lost a lot of that, unfortunately. So besides building a house with Cass, what else are you doing to kind of strive to be debt free, self sustaining, et cetera, with your family. I mean, homestead is more than just the house, right? For sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we, Natalie grew up in a very frugal family and I didn't. And we kind of really focus on that for, from the time we got married until now and moving forward. We want to get out of debt as soon as possible. You know, we, we want to get these loans paid off as soon as possible. And luckily, again, like I mentioned with her, her job is really going great with what she's doing. And we're also living frugally and not spending too much on stuff. We've got some ideas for some other side cash coming in. I've got my little YouTube channel and, you know, making like 500 bucks a month. That's, that's not nothing. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, but we would like to be able to grow that into something that's, you know, plus a thousand dollars every month to kind of pay the, the bills. And after the mortgage is paid off and, you know, we don't have a car payment right now, we just paid that off and doing all these zero percent financing same as cash deals like we're, we're really doing a great job saving towards the future but you know natalie is she's got a fear like what happens if my voice goes and i can't record audiobooks anymore what are we going to do what are you going to do to make money and i'm not a teacher anymore i let my teaching license expire i'm like i'm not going back to that i'm not going back to the schools and, and uh so we've got we've got some ideas and at the very top of our property our top of our five acres it's actually about 300 feet above us because we're on the slope. We want to build, and you mentioned it earlier, a geodesic dome. We've got the idea, we've got the, the plans already going for us. I'm gonna just rent a mini excavator or, or a big mini excavator for about a month and clear a nice clear path all the way up to the top of our property, open up a big like 50 foot by 50 foot square space, knock down some trees, put a deck there and pop up a big 24 foot wide geodesic dome you know, do the Airbnb thing. We are within 10 miles of 10 vineyards right here. And we've got the National Park, we've got Washington, DC. You know, I was just at the Homesteaders of America conference, which was in Front Royal, like it is every year. And every single Airbnb in the area is maxed out. Like you cannot find them anywhere. There's not enough Airbnbs here. And people want really, you know, interesting and unique experiences when they stay somewhere, whether it's an old farmhouse or if you're trying to get into glamping, and you've talked about that on your show before, trying to make more money with your land so that you have more control and more capital building up for your life. And so we really think that we could we could charge a good penny per night for that geodesic dome, put a little kitchenette in it. You know, we've got our budget worked out. And even if we only have 50% occupancy in the first two years, it would all be paid off. And everything after that would be profit moving forward based on what we've done with the budget. So where we are, we're really ripe for the picking for Airbnb. So we've got big plans for that. And uh, that plus Natalie's business and, you know, little side gigs here and there with YouTube and just saving up money. Uh, we should be debt free in about five years, which would be huge. I mean, we're, we're 33 now. Actually, I just turned 34 yesterday. My bad. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're, we're in our early 30s and to be debt free in our 30s will be really great and just continue saving moving forward, you know. No, absolutely. And that's that's a huge achievement to be in your 30s and be debt free, including the house. That's that's massive. And it's again, we're back to like our grandparents and great grandparents, depending on how old you know people listen to me are. Because I feel like I say, well, our grandparents, my grandparents are, are wusses or whatever. I'm like my grandparents are dead. They've been dead for 30 years. When I use grandparents, I'm talking about a different generation here, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's what our grandparents did. You know, my my uh, my granddad bought his property which was about an acre and a half a pretty decent house it actually had an old house that it turned into what we call a shanty more like a shed now and then the new house which was built in 1897 or something like that 
And he bought that place in the 20s for, I think, $987, if I remember right, you know, and and anything that it needed, they did or they didn't have it. It's uh, it's it's a mindset that I think is coming back. Like I said, as much as I hate YouTube sometimes, as I sit here in my gulag shirt for those on the video, <laughs> um, yeah, they've done a lot of good in, in allowing people like yourself and, and myself and all these other people to put this content out and expi- inspire others and realize you can either sacrifice now and have complete independence and freedom for the majority of your life, or you can have more now, but be dependent upon somebody else for the rest of your life. Um, mortgages have a place. I mean, there's, they're not evil inherent of themselves, but like one of the few things I learned in high school that I never forgot was an accounting teacher taught us the root of the word mortgage. And the first part of the word is mort, is a mortality as in death. And the second part of the word is gauge from Old English as in grip. So to be under a mortgage is to be under death's grip, mm-hmm. meaning that most people would expect that they would end up never actually paying it off. They'll die in debt. And like we've gotten to a point now where we're like we're totally OK with that. Like the word itself was a cautionary thing. That's how it was created. And it's become like, well, you're, and I remember a good friend of mine back when I was young who uh, often gave me advice and looking at his life going, our lives are the same and you're 25 years older than me. So I, I don't think I'm going to take your advice. <laughs> that doesn't seem like the way it should work. But he would always say, you know, don't worry about debt. You're no one if you don't owe somebody money in this country. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, boomer. And that wasn't a thing back <laughs> then, but if it was, exactly. I would have said it, man. I would have said it. So, um, What's next for you guys? Like the house is one thing and I think you're almost done, but not quite like you are living in it. Mm -hmm. Right. But maybe there's some things left to do, but what do you, what's your, I mean, you talked about the Airbnb kind of hip camp clamping thing. I think that's cool, but what else do you have plans? Cause five acres is a pretty good sized chunk of dirt. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of tying into being more self-sustaining and saving money in the future. uh, I I've got the little homestead starting up, you know, we did meat chickens last year. I, I have some lawn space up here in the mountain, and uh, I was able to run 25 meat chickens last year, and that was a start, you know, and we've got raised bed gardens, and those produce a lot during the, the growing season. We've got the chickens, and we got some ducks, you know, I got some ducks from Morgan at Goldshaw Farm who learned a lot about ducks from you, and uh, so we've got a lot of homestead plans up here, and, you know, I would like to be in a place where we're not buying meat from anybody uh, unless I'm bartering for it. We've got tons of cattle herds all around us and paddocks all around this area but i've got room up here for pigs and i've got room up here for goats in fact i want to use both pigs and goats to kind of clear the underbrush and do do their thing naturally on our on our hillside mountainside up here and be able to harvest the pigs and harvest the goats for meat and kind of put on like a a regular thing like that so between meat chickens goats pigs the garden eggs that we get up here we're, we're make it a big dent in our food bill and, and what we need. So, um, you know, with, with that and trying to expand and then doing the Airbnb, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. Um, with Natalie and her business as an audiobook narrator, she's at the mercy, again, of noise. And even though we moved out of a townhouse out here, it's crazy how noisy the top of a mountain can be, especially when you're in the flight path of Dulles International Airport. <laughs> and uh, so we have plans to do this epic booth bunker where we're going to take a shipping container and no, don't worry everybody it's not going to collapse i have a i have a welding neighbor near really close to me just down the mountain and he's a big big shop with a you know big backhoe and everything he does giant welding jobs and he's going to help me reinforce the the structure of the shipping container just a 20 footer in fact i can't even fit a 40 foot container up my mountain road it won't get up here there's too many twists and turns but we're going to sink that sucker in the ground and uh, make it safe and she will have an underground recording studio so that no matter if it's raining or if you know 737 is passing 2,000 feet over our head to land we'll still be fine that she can record and not be at the mercy of all that kind of stuff so that's kind of cool and you know an underground bunker might double as other things you know besides her recording studio space permitting so that'll be a really cool project coming up and you know, I'll, I'll have the big excavator out here digging a big hole behind my house. And, you know, I might keep it an extra week and dig a hole for a pool later on and all that kind of good stuff. So when you have five acres, you got to use the five acres, you know. Don't just, like, sit here in the middle and be like, oh, look at all this space. Like, we've got 
we've got trees to take down for firewood and the Airbnb to clear out and all sorts of fun stuff coming up. So uh, it, we're in for a busy hey. few years coming up. That, that sounds just freaking awesome, dude. It really does. I'm, I'm excited for you. I thought of one thing, and I, I kind of let it go and just came back to me when you mentioned your sound studio. Um, you mentioned that she's afraid that she could lose her voice and not be able to do her job. And maybe I need to look into this, too, because I don't necessarily have, like, a great singing voice or anything, but my voice is how I make my living. Absolutely. And I remember reading about somebody. It might have been Marilyn Monroe. with was some, you know, hot to trot actress back in the day or whatever. And she had her legs insured by Lloyd's of London. I wonder if, like, there's a, you know, because the cost of insurance is relative to the value of the insured, right? right. So, like, you know, if your voice is worth a hundred grand a year, well, then you're insuring a hundred grand a year. You're not insuring Marilyn Monroe's freaking legs, which was probably <laughs> a publicity stuff. But I wonder if it's possible to like get specific disability insurance for a specific thing that's critical to what you do. I have no idea. Maybe there's an insurance agent out there that can tell us that just an, an off, oddball goofball idea. But it's actually a really relevant point because like when I do my workshops, there's times where I'm like, I'm out. I'm not doing any more because my voice is going from three, yeah. four days in a row. And I'm like this, I have to, like, I know the first couple of days back, it's going to suck. Maybe I have to take a day off, recover, but I can't do long-term damage. Right. right. And I think we need to think about that more than just voices. Like if you make a living with your hands and you lose, you know, the use of a hand, like, so that's like another thing in life that we do need to at least be prepared for. Uh, it's an interesting thing to bring up. Like, I don't know what would really destroy your voice, but it certainly happens to people. Yeah, it does happen to a lot of people. She actually has friends that have had to take six months off of recording, tell all their contracts, all the publishers and authors, I can't record for the next six months. So it's, it is a real thing. Um, and a lot of people actually look to her for vocal health advice because of her career in opera. She was singing three hours, three hour long Wagner operas all the time, and she'd be, she'd be fine. But all the people that are getting into audiobooks for the first time and narrating for the first time, they're like, dude, I can't record for more than two hours and my voice gives out. She can be in there for eight hours and it's no thing for her. But you do have to think about moderating what you're doing and, and making sure you don't push yourself too far because a scratchy throat does not make money for us. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that. I just went and saw Aaron Lewis in concert and um, man, he did a, some of his old stuff from back in his stain days with the grunge deep rock. And I'm like, man, yeah. how, how do you do that 150 <laughs> nights a year and not blow out your vocal cords you know um it's just a little interesting side there um what are some other things you you guys are doing on your property like i know you because i looked you've got animals and gardening and stuff and like you, you mentioned kind of the chicken thing and like you know, kudos on that like people say like 25 birds that's not that much but if you're doing it to make a living no it's not right. for your family that's a chicken dinner every other week for a year mm -hmm. right you just skinned one meal a week every other one meal a week every other week for a year by doing that and that and it's you, you i think another thing people do is they'll like they'll do that and they'll say well we raised these birds and they cost us 11 dollars a bird total cost or 12 dollars a bird or whatever you should know that whatever the numbers you should know right. and then they'll say well you know we could have went to the store and we could have bought that bird for seven bucks no you could not exactly no you could not you could have bought a pilgrim's pride or purdue steroid infused you know, GMO infused chicken that lived up to its wing pits in its own manure, or you could have bought the bird you produced for like 25 bucks. For sure. Right. So like, I, I think that's a fantastic thing. Is there anything else? Like, you know, you mentioned goats or whatever, like kind of what's your like, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure would do with goats. So like, what's kind of your plan going forward? Uh, sorry, it froze up there on me for a second. So you're asking about infrastructure for goats? Yeah. Yeah. Like, cause if you're talking about goats, dude, like, yeah. You know, John Willis was like, yeah, I had goats and I came home and two of them were on top of my Porsches and I don't have a goat anymore. There's no more goats. You know, Nicole yeah. had them on the roof of her house. Like, mm -hmm. so you got to you got to be thinking about that. Yeah, we I do have the challenge of putting them on a slope. So, you know, the fence height will vary with the slope as it's going. Right now, the idea is to do a five foot tall woven wire with T-post and have paddocks where I can rotate them from one area of the slope to the other. Um, like three or four goats at a time and uh, having electric strands over top of that. Um, we do have bears. I don't think a bear would be too interested in a goat, but hey, if it's super hungry, you know, we, we might have curious bears and, and all that kind of thing. So with, with the help of hopefully livestock guardian dogs 
and tall fencing and the fact that I'm home all the time, you know, uh, hopefully we should be able to manage it with, with a little bit of fence training. And, you know, I, it's not like I'm naive. I expect them to get out from time to time, but the, uh, the big time goal is to have a really tall perimeter fence around the entire property or at least most of the property gotcha. at some point. So, you know, right now my chickens are in an inner poultry netting, you know, electric poultry, poultry netting. And then beyond that is a larger electric netting that's actually for goats uh, when I come to think of it. And in between those two levels are is my beagle. He hangs out outside and he's the protector of the chickens and the ducks. So having multiple layers to help keep those goats in place, uh, hopefully we'll cut down on some of those broke goats but when it comes down to it they'll get out and i should be able to find them pretty close to where we are and yeah we'll get them in the freezer at some point cool yeah i mean i i, I pick on goats all the time because they can be a problem but I, I never complain about eating them so and i like goat's milk i just want somebody else to milk the goat for me that's all um anyway how can people kind of stay in touch with you guys follow your progress etc yeah, uh, we're just on the standard socials with Facebook and Instagram. Uh, our, our YouTube channel is all under Little Mountain Life and pretty easy to find. We're just short of 11,000 subscribers, so you, sh you should find us at the top of all your searches and all that good stuff. Um, but we're just we're trying to upload somewhat regularly and just share our journey and, you know, share our mistakes and and our successes. And it's been really cool to have people reach out to me and say, hey, we're looking to build a pole barn house down here in like South Carolina or out here in Colorado. And they take all the things that I've done, whether it's, you know, putting in the DIY mini splits to cool my house and they see me do it, or putting in the radiant heat in my floor by myself. And now I have a warm house because I did it. People are following that stuff. So it's been really cool to follow uh, what they've been doing with me. Like I met like five people this weekend that follow my channel. I'm like, wait, people actually do follow me. So uh, yeah, you can find us at Little Mountain Life and uh, we're gonna continue sharing all the fun up here for sure. And I'll make sure that when the audio version of this podcast goes out, that we have links to all your social media, everything else that it was mentioned or uh, useful for uh, podcast notes will be in the, uh, the episode notes today. Like they are always, if you caught this on YouTube, um, you know, maybe it'll be an hour after this uh, interview that uh, a link will be added to the description where you can go over there and you can find all that stuff. So if you guys want to stay in touch with uh, uh, with Don, easy enough to do. Definitely subscribe to his channel. And Don, thanks for being with us. This is a great conversation. Thanks for having me. I've been listening for a long time. It's a pleasure being here with you.